Um, right, I think we might get a few stragglers coming in, but we'll um, kick it off and let's with that. Yeah. Okay, so technical difficulties, we're not on the screen, we're on the laptop, so if you can't see, feel free to scrooge forward or um, stand up or, I'm not really a rules person, so do whatever you want. Um, so, the year is 2007. Gordon Brown has become the British Prime Minister. Uh, Maroon 5 have reinvented themselves, not for the last time, with their second studio album, and the cinema-going public of the UK is gearing up for a cinematic event. Following a shaky start to the 21st century, people are excited for the next film to be coming from duo Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. It's going to be gothic, it's going to be exciting, it's going to be a, a dark British fairy tale. It's going to have all three colours that Tim Burton is comfortable using. Around Christmas, people are excited for Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Now, if we go back and we take a look at the metrics from the past 10 years, we can see that actually it's been um, it's held up fairly well. It seems to be fairly well liked. But what a lot of people don't remember is back at the time, there was a lot of uh, anger about the release of the film. A lot of people walking out of theatres, a lot of complaints. Because there's one thing that the marketing didn't mention. Sweeney Todd is a musical. Now, looking back, it seems like fairly obvious thing to happen but at the time unless you were particularly interested in filmmaking or Tim Burton movies you wouldn't necessarily have known that it was going to be a musical so a lot of people weren't happy when they turned up and they saw Johnny Depp singing in his best English accent that's kind of what I want to talk about today not Tim Burton or Johnny Depp but advertising the difference between what we're told and the truth behind the, the facade really my name's Ben I'm a photographer, I'm a voiceover artist, and I'm also uh, an activist. I run the website uh, and YouTube channel Keep a Vegan. Um, and my focus is really just to take the confusion that comes from uh, multiple media outlets talking about veganism, nutrition, environment, welfare, um, and just present the truth using science and just simplifying everything down to what is and what isn't true. So, today's the talk is called brainwashing by them no come on in <laughs> brainwashing and pies with people in them how eating meat is made normal um, spoiler warning for those of you who haven't seen Sweeney Todd there's people in the pies so my uh, hypothesis if you will the killing and eating of animals and their secretions so milk eggs honey is made normal to the everyday person by a sustained and conscious effort by the meat, dairy and egg industries to alter and subvert the public's understanding of the slaughter harvest process. So that's what I'm going to take a look at today. First thing to really talk about when we're discussing anything about how uh, the, the general public is aware of their consumption of animals is the notion of cognitive dissonance. Is everyone vaguely aware of cognitive dissonance as a theory? A few nods, a few shakes, that's perfect. So, in what I'm concerned is starting to become a bit of a catchphrase for me, to grossly oversimplify, the idea is that we have um, an understanding of who we are as a person and how we want to act, who we believe we should act, and then we have how we actually act in the world around us. Cognitive dissonance is when you do something that doesn't line up with how you think you should act. So, perfect example. Hello. No, take a seat, by all means. More the merrier. So, perfect example of this. An environmentalist, someone who is very keen about uh, the environment and they want to look after the planet and everything. That's how they want to act. Yep, come on in, find a seat or sit or take someone else's seat. It's up to you. Um, they want to preserve the planet. That's, that's how they view the world. That's how they want to act. But how they actually act, they don't recycle. They walk up to a bin, they take a plastic bottle, and they just stick it in the regular trash. There's cognitive distance there. That moment of pausing before putting the bottle in the bin, that's the moment where that person has to choose to overcome their cognitive dissonance, either by changing their perception of who they want to be, changing their actions, not putting it in the bin, justifying it with, there's no recycling bins around, or I've, I've not got time, I have to put this in the bin, then I have to run somewhere. 
or ignoring it. They just put it out of their mind. So if we look at cognitive dissonance in terms of the consumption of animal products, I love animals. I am an animal lover. If you'd asked me three years ago, I would have told you I am an animal lover without question, shadow of a doubt. But then the action is I pay for animals to be killed for my consumption. Because ultimately that's the point. The, the point at which you do the maximum damage is not when you eat the food. I mean, unless you're looking at nutritionally, in which case, don't do it. But the point at which you do the maximum damage socially is when you actually pay for that product. Because that's the point you're reinforcing the mechanism that allows all of this to happen. So cognitive dissonance, you cannot be an animal lover and also pay for animals to be killed. But we don't experience cognitive dissonance, or I certainly didn't, the same way. If I was an environmentalist who wanted to throw a plastic bottle in the regular bin, there'd be a moment of pause, I'd feel guilty, I'd, I'd question what I'm doing. But I could quite happily tell you I was an animal lover whilst eating an animal product. It doesn't cross your mind. And that is, uh, what I would argue, a very intentional and purposeful thing. So, in order to overcome your cognitive dissonance, you have to change your perception or your actions. So, two sides of the equation, you have to change one. This doesn't come up very often. What you get more frequently is people justifying their perception or justifying their actions. Or ignoring their perceptions or their actions there's no bin nearby, I can't recycle this now, or I have to run, or it's just one bottle, it doesn't matter. The reason you don't feel, or most people don't feel that dissonance when they sit down to an animal... Hello, Jeff, come jump in. The reason people don't feel that dissonance when they sit down to a meal containing animal products, despite being a self-proclaimed animal lover, is because these two, justification and ignorance, are being done for them. And it's being done in a immensely complex system, which I'm perhaps erroneously going to try and simplify today. So looking at these two things, there are three tools which the meat, dairy, egg, fish, the honey, all of them, they're all bad. There are three tools that they use to keep that dissonance from happening. Language, what is said and how it is said. Implication. What is said without ever actually saying it? And silence. What isn't being said at all? So, if we take a look at that equation again, I love animals, I pay for animals to be killed, the everyday person doesn't think about it in those terms because a very conscious mechanism is covering up that second part. I love animals, I eat meat. It's a completely separate question. And the reason this veil is able to fall across the notion of you paying for animals to be harmed and killed is because language, implication, and silence are all used in concert with each other to keep this veil in place. So look at language. We all know language is, is fundamentally important. It, it defines how we communicate with each other. And we all know that language is inherently biased. It's impossible to talk to someone about something without being biased. Just the very words you use either denotes your attitude to that thing or the attitude you're trying to convince the other person of, even in just everyday normal conversation. Now, Loftus and Palmer. I won't spend too long on this because even my dog knows about the Loftus and Palmer study. Um, reconstruction of automobile destruction. Back in the 70s, Loftus and Palmer did a study, a two-part study, where they took a number of people and they sat them down and they had them watch a film. It was a footage of a car crash, a collision. Slow moving on. And the participants were then all asked a question, but there were slight variations on the question asked. They were either asked, how fast were the cars going when they contacted each other, when they bang bumped each other, when they hit each other, when they collided with each other, and when they smashed each other. So, they all saw the same film, but they were all asked different questions, all ranging from contacted all the way up to smashed. What do you think happened? When they gave a speed, what do you think happened? There was a curve up, exactly. The people who were asked how fast were they going when they contacted, kind of gave a, a rough speed, and then you can see an arc, all the way up to how fast were they going when they smashed each other. There's an almost 10 miles per hour difference 
in their estimation of the speed. Now the question there is, were they biased in the answer? Were they saying what they thought they should say? Or was their actual recollection of the incident being altered by the language used? So they then did a second part to the study. They took um, another bunch of people, 150 people, sat them watching a similar film. 60 seconds of a car driving and then a small collision at the end. They then took 50 and said, go away, come back next week. The other 100, half of them, they asked how, how fast do you think they were going when they contact each other? And the other 50, they said, how fast do you think they were going when they smashed each other? Same thing. They then all went away and came back the following week and had to fill in a questionnaire. And one of the questions on this questionnaire was, did you see any broken glass? Now, there was no broken glass in the film, but as you can probably imagine, the ones who had been asked how fast do you think they were going when they were smashed a week prior, nearly double the number of people said that, yeah, there was broken glass. I remember there being broken glass in the video. Now, there's been problems with this going back. People are saying that the viewing of video is not the same thing as seeing something in real life, so it doesn't necessarily carry over to eyewitness testimony, but the point is that language is fundamentally important. It massively affects the way we communicate with each other, and it affects how we think about the world around us. Probably not going to hear it. I've got a few video clips to show you, but it's very loud. So, this is um, Malcolm Gladwell talking about uh, coffee tastes. And on average, if you ask people, what do you like in a coffee? They'll say, oh, like a rich, dark, hearty roast. That's all they'll say, oh, a rich, dark, hearty roast. Most people actually like weak, milky coffee. But they don't say that. They say rich, dark, hearty roast because that's what the advertising says. This coffee is amazing. It's a rich, dark, hearty roast. And so people will parrot that belief. They've aligned their preference with coffee with what marketing tells them is a good coffee, even though that's actually contradictory to what they want to drink. So the second of those two tools that keep the net in place, implication. You'll be glad you can't hear this one. This is one of the most cringeworthy adverts I've ever seen. This is uh, an American Egg Board advert starring uh, movies Kevin Bacon, um, all about eggs. And this one is very important for implication because the actress starts the video by saying, there's nothing better than eggs to start your day. But it's not a fact stated by the advert, it's an opinion stated by the actress, the, the character. So it doesn't hold up in court. Kevin Bacon then mentions protein in eggs. There's plenty of protein in eggs, which there is. I'm not going to get started on that one today. He then goes on to say, are you ready for a nutritional powerhouse of a breakfast? At no point does he say eggs are a nutritional powerhouse of a breakfast. There's a long history to this advert of all the things they're not allowed to say eggs are. They can say eggs are nutrient dense, but as Michael Greger, Dr. Michael Greger says, you can call Twinkies nutrient dense. It's a meaningless term. But in saying nothing better than eggs, lots of protein in eggs, are you ready for a nutritional powerhouse for breakfast? The implication there is that eggs are a nutritionally balanced, good for you breakfast to start your day with. But I don't state it outright, and that's how they get away with it. There's a, as I said, there's a long history behind that one. I massively recommend you go and check out Emily Barrick, a Bite Size Vegan. She did a video all about the history of this advert. Um, she's one of my heroes. She's one of the reasons I'm stood here today. So go and give her some love and some support. Um, Dr. Michael Greger, which I think Emily mentions, also uh, talks about this advert, so check both of them out. Um, I'll put links up on the social media and everything today. Silence, the last of those three things. I obviously don't have a video to show you for this one because the whole point is they don't mention it. Language and implication will get you so far, but there are things they fundamentally cannot show you in advertising when it comes to meat and dairy products because there's no excusing it. There's no reframing it to make it look positive. There's no nutritional powerhouse of a breakfast when you see the inside of a slaughterhouse. So the other part of that trio is things just not being mentioned at all. So we've got some video examples. Again, you'll probably struggle to hear them, but we'll give it a go. Language. This is a, a Marks and Spencer's advert from last year, I think. Um, and they're talking about beef. Is the, the, it might be this year, actually, the summer beef campaign. The whole point is we know where all of our beef comes from. We know where all of it is. We can trace it all the way back to the farm and the animals. But the use of the language, our beef, we know where our beef comes from. A beef is a, a meaningless term. It's a, a commodity that can be quantified, but it's not really qualifiable. It's not linked to the animal in any way. We know where our beef comes from. Well, really, we all know where the beef comes from, but I'm also not going to get started on MNS and their traceability programs because we know what happened two years ago with their Christmas turkeys. Moving on. 
McDonald's strangely doing my job for me here, not what they were intending to do, but 100% beef, not 100% cow. Um, this is the kind of language used, it's separation from the term, beef, um, steak, we've got ribeye, we even refer to the, the breeds, Aberdeen Angus steak. We don't say hairy cow flesh because it doesn't sell well. Um, it's the same for, I mean, in a way it's a shame for the chickens and the fish because we don't care about chickens and fish enough to bother giving them a different product name. We say chicken breast, but we never see, we never see anyone refer to the bits that aren't the chicken breast because that then just becomes chicken. Um, we don't care about chickens because they're not mammals that are so closely identifiable with us. We're okay to refer to them as chicken as a general term. Fish, we can't hear fish scream, so it doesn't matter. Just, they're just fish, they're weird, slippery things that move about in the ocean, catch them, and you can cook them, and nobody really cares. Another McDonald's one. And this is their, uh, there's all sorts of bits in chicken nuggets. And really the whole point of this advert is, we only, we only use the best chicken, and it's just the 100% chicken breast that goes into the McNuggets. No reference to the animal, and you'll also notice when they uh, cut to their preparation area, it's some strange sci-fi lab. It's not a slaughterhouse, it's some kind of bizarre fictional land where just food is made, chicken breast just grows out of pots, and we don't have to worry about it. Chicken breast does not equal the chicken, and the public is fine with that. So, examples of implication. You don't need sound for this one. Happy Egg Company. This is all about eggs are happy and chickens are happy, everyone's happy, everyone's loving it. Look at this happy farmer dancing around collecting his eggs. Loving it, he's got his little branded box, she's dancing with her eggs. Yeah, more eggs, it's great. Lots of dancing, lots of music, lots of happy, everyone's great. Who can, who can tell for me the implication that happened immediately with that advert that's gone unstated but it's been said. Exactly. We are showing this. They never say all of our eggs come from this farm. They never say these are the chickens that will produce Happy Egg Company eggs. But it's implied. You come away with the subconscious understanding that that must be where the eggs come from because you see the guy with the branded box collecting the eggs. That's what it actually looks like, the Happy Egg Company farms. Back in 2010, Sky News teamed up with, uh, I believe it was Viva, to uh, do some undercover reporting and investigate the two, I think it's two farms up in Scotland that supply Happy Egg. And the conditions were, as we've all seen, deplorable. They were disgusting. The animals were crawling with uh, parasites. They were emaciated, featherless. They were injured. There were carcasses on the floor. It's all familiar footage for us by this point. And there we see our little RSPCA badge of honour. I'm going to wait until I get started on the RSPCA. So that's the truth. But I'll never mention that. We'll just get the implication that it's just a happy Teletubbies-esque field where these chickens are, are bred for their eggs. Now the McDonald's one. I'm not going to show all of this one. This is their organic dairy farm. This is all about where they get the milk from, for McDonald's products. Again, same implication, lots of cows out in a happy field. They're reared on a 100% organic diet, not they are all 100% grass-fed. Organic diet. When outside, they graze on grass and luscious clover. Not how often are they outside, when they're outside. They're all checked to make sure they're healthy, and this is, for me, the most disgusting part. Shot of the cows walking, shot the cows walking into the milking parlour, shot the cows being hooked up, to the milking machine. It implies a consent for the animal. It's their time to get milk, it's part of their routine, so they walk into place. At no point does this advert show the infants being torn away from their mother's side, nor does it show the days that mother cows can spend crying for their stolen young. The implication is, it's fine, it's organic, everything's fine, everything's happy, and it's consensual, the cows don't mind. So let's take a look at the, uh, at the requirements for organic milk, shall we? I guess while we're here. Look at feeding. Is it, you go through this, and I'm going to put it up on the website so you can read it all. And everything's linked as well. Animals should be fed a certain amount 
of grass. They should be allowed to do a certain amount of grazing. They should be allowed this much fresh air. They can be allowed supplements, they can be allowed uh, enrichment, like minerals, vitamins, that's fine. Shouldn't really if they're, they're getting all their nutritional needs in a natural environment, but they can get the supplementation. But all the way through, it's, they should. They should get this, they should get this, they should get this. It's very airy guidelines. Until we get to BSE, in which case it's a must. So the guidelines don't exclude the notion of saying they must and must not be this. It's just should when it comes to what is ultimately their welfare and what the British public think they're paying for. Housing, this one I'm going to draw particular attention to. Dairy cows should be allowed a minimum of six metres squared per animal. So for a frame of reference, that's about a me and a half up and about a me that way. And that's not even, they have to be allowed that much space for their whole lives. That's how much they should be allowed. And again, if we look through print adverts, especially for dairy, it's commonplace. Here's the product against the backdrop of the verdant rolling fields. Pretty sure these are all whales, actually. Um, and the products are natural. You've got cows in the background. Everything's happy. The implication is this is where your food comes from without ever saying a word to clarify. Silence. This one, I didn't, again, I didn't really have a video to show for silence because the whole point is that there's nothing to show. I really want to show this one because it shows how far removed the animals can be. They are, in this advert, I hope this advert makes you as angry as it does me, the chicken becomes a joke. Um, and as a filmmaker, it's pretty horrifically put together as well, but I'm aware that's a separate issue. And it is, it is DMX's uh, X Gone Give It To You, um, problematic character in and of himself, and it's just shots of a chicken, supposedly dancing to a very swaggery song. This is for KFC, and the whole advert is just this nonsense, coupled by the phrase at the end, the chicken, the whole chicken, and nothing but the chicken. The chicken becomes a joke. It's a laughing stock. And it's so far removed from the reality of what they go through. The killing and eating of animals and their secretions is made normal to the everyday public by a conscious and sustained effort on the part of the meat and dairy and egg industries to change the narrative when it comes to the slaughter and harvest process. So how do we stop this? How do we stop, if the byline is we want to stop the killing and eating of animals, well, we have to make the public aware. We have to take away the illusion that's been put in place with these three things. Ultimately, it all starts in childhood. I don't, next time you're going shopping and you're in the supermarket, the, the, the cereal aisle or the sweet aisle, I want you to take a moment in the middle of the aisle and just crouch to this height and you'll observe a very strange thing happening. Suddenly you'll start to feel watched. And that's when nearly all children's cereal box mascots, uh, confectionery mascots, crisp mascots, they are all placed to be making eye contact with your child as you walk down the aisle. Drawing the child in and becoming an attractive product they have to pick up. They are being engaged with way beyond the eye line of their parents. We anthropomorphize animals. We show uh, yogurt and cheese with uh, the animals, the, the cows smiling and they're happy. They're almost infant versions of the animals and they're, they're happy. It's all part of the process. The animal is linked to the product, but in a way that implies an innocence. Now, we know what happens when children see the footage. When they see, we've all seen the videos of um, the children freaking out over their parents cutting up a, a fish that they're preparing for dinner or chicken they find out that that chicken that's being prepared was a chicken they ask can we take it to the doctor can we save it can we take it to the vet we'll keep it as a pet as Gary Urofsky said and I think he appropriated it from someone else if you put a apple and a rabbit in a crib with a child with a baby the baby will instinctively play with one and eat the other we are I'm not going to get into this now we are herbivores we are absolutely not omnivorous in nature my talk here last year was on that subject you can find it on the YouTube channel um, also look at the work of Dr. Milton Mills, um, slightly more qualified than I am. But um, we are herbivorous, it's not in our nature. So we need this system to cover up what we're doing, to change the narrative so we don't think about it. 
I love animals and I eat animals. Some people justify their perception and actions. They die painlessly. Some people ignore. I can't stand looking at that footage. Some people justify. We're apex predators. Some people ignore. It's not that simple. The constant justifications and ignorances that people come up with. And I did the exact same thing. It's, it's subconscious at this level. Bacon, lol. It's all exaggerated. The footage isn't real. This footage comes from a different farm somewhere else. It comes from a different country. It's not applicable to the food that I consume. It's not my fault. It doesn't relate to the choices that I make. There's only really one way to change your perception or your actions. Now, no, no one is willingly going to change their perception to say, I'm not an animal lover. There are always, always uh, cases, but for the most part, there's only one real way to get over this. Change your actions. I'm going vegan. The equation then becomes, I love animals and I will not eat animals. I love animals and I will not pay for these animals to be killed. I love animals and I will not allow for these animals to be tortured and, and put through horrendous fear and pain and then killed purely for my pleasure. The two weapons we have, money and voice. This is, in my opinion, one of the most perfect democracies you'll ever see. Your vote when you pay for an animal product or a non-animal product is final. The industry is panicking. All of them are. And there's a very good reason for that. It's because there's no arguing with consumers saying, I'm not going to buy this anymore, I'm going to buy this instead. I'm not going to buy dairy milk, I'm going to buy soy milk or almond milk or any other milk. The, the vote we have is powerful. And our voice is just as powerful. The way to get beyond this uh, illusion, this net that's cast over the notion of you pay for the animals you have killed to consume them, is to spread the truth. And that's what we're all doing here. When Sweeney Todd came out, bring it back round. As I mentioned before, there was, there was backlash. People were not happy. Someone actually made a complaint to the Advertising Standards Authority saying that it had been misadvertised. Now, when you see the trailer for Sweeney Todd, there is actually a bit in the middle where there's a, a snippet of a song, but it doesn't quite fit. And all of the other marketing cliches you expect with the musical were kept out of the trailer. So most people ignored it. They just kind of didn't think about it. I actually remember someone at the time saying, it's not a musical, is it? And the response was, don't be stupid. I mean, the film previous to that was a musical, but no, don't be stupid. The clues were there, but people ignored it. And when they found out the truth, there was backlash. People were not happy. And that's what we're seeing now in a slightly more important fashion, but it's all the same thing. Last year, who remembers this? Uh, Eden um, Farmed Animal Sanctuary in uh, Ireland, Sandra Higgins. Their advert, milk is inhumane. The whole point was pointing out that you can't call milk humane. Complaints were made and the Advertising Standards Authority upheld the advert. They looked at the evidence and said, no, you can't argue with the fact that dairy milk is inhumane. The removal of the children, the conditions they go through, it's inhumane. Now that's the Advertising Standards Authority, that's a regulator in the United Kingdom saying that, no, it's inhumane. Same thing this year, they've done another one which is about uh, animal testing. And again, there have been complaints, and again, the ASA has said, no, we look at the evidence, we can't argue with this. And that's the importance of what we're doing. We're telling the truth. There's no repositioning what we're saying. I've got the uh, HDB report somewhere I was going to read, but I don't think I've got time. Um, and it talks all about flexitarians, we can reposition ourselves, we reposition dairy or, or chicken to make it more appealing to them as a health food. We don't have to reposition. What we're talking about is the truth. It is killing us. It is killing the planet. And it is making us all sick. And it's bad for the animals. There's no arguing with that. Now, there's been backlash. Obviously, the, the, the industries are fighting back. They're doing everything they can. They're trying to get um, the almond milks and plant-based milks not called milks anymore because it's not fair. They want meat products. In Germany, it's banned. You can't call a, a vegan sausage a sausage anymore. Uh, Viva have had two bans this year rejected to advertise and saying that they're banned because they can't be held up. The pigs one that was the big cinema adventure that, that uh, we were all going for, the evidence to say that one wasn't allowed was from the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Pardon my French, but my ass. These are the people that have standards by which animals can be farmed by, but those standards are still cruel. They're still terrible. Come on to that later. This is the situation. 
for a long time they've got by by using language, implication, and silence to control the narrative about where animal products come from so we don't think about it. I didn't think about it. I was an animal lover and I would have fought you if you'd said I wasn't three years ago. Well, I would have tried, just I'm not really a fighter. The point is that that's not working anymore. With things like Instagram and, and Twitter, social media, the number of people who are interested in getting up there and actually fighting to get this message out there it can't be ignored anymore we're breaking through that barrier that controls that so now the advertisements are going to get weirder they're going to get more attacking they're going to get more offensive they're going to get stranger but at the end of the day as long as we understand the tools they're using to try and confuse us and get past us and fool the public into thinking this is acceptable they can't win So, as I say, my name's Ben, I run Keep It Vegan, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. If you've never seen a Keep It Vegan video before, may I recommend the RSPCA and Eggs one? Um, it gets a little bit heated, but I'm personally proud of it. Um, it looks at uh, things like the maceration, the, the grinder that baby chicks go into that the RSPCA deems is a humane kill, their words, not mine. Um, and everything can also be found at the website keepavegan.com. The website is currently down, perfect timing, but you can still find everything on all the social media platforms and I will be updating once the website's back up. I'm hoping a couple of days, but we'll see. I was hoping that I could get the projector working, but best laid plans. Uh, what time are we at at the moment? Oh, I've made a good time. I must have talked really, really fast. So, I've got time for any uh, questions, if anyone has any, about what we talked about today or veganism in general, activism, anything? Quiet crowd, oh yeah. Yeah. I would like to say I made a very conscious effort to exclude speciesism from the presentation. The truth is, this is four days of work. So, uh, with more time, yeah, the plan is to get for speciesism and, and how we place ourselves socially compared to the animals as well. Because you're right, it does tie all in together with those things. Um, but the real focus for me. Um, and the past couple of days of getting this presentation together was to look at how the advertising affects us because it's scary. I mean, when I first, um, when I first went vegan, I started um, paying closer attention to the adverts. As Sam will attest, every time we're in the cinema, I start every film angry because there's always a food advert that goes, we only use the finest beef. And I'm sat there fuming five minutes into the film because it is omnipresent. There's no getting away from it we think about Christmas especially that's coming up Easter as well on the other side of the year the advertising the overwhelming amount of material footage photographs radio adverts that all three of these tools just blanket the public and then people get frustrated with vegans for talking about it all the time <laughs> we're kind of you can't get past it so speech is definitely going to be added in um, I'll probably put I'll put this on the website as soon as it's up and then I'll put um, a fully updated version of the presentation up and then I'll probably do a, a video covering this as well. Yep. Sorry, I didn't quite hear it. Yeah. There's, um, I would argue there are three main groups you've got the, the animals that we eat or we uh, we abuse to get the products from um, and we all know the position they occupy in society and then you've got the animals that we love we love giraffes and dogs and the yulan festival in china is abhorrent and uh, we love elephants and ivory hunting is terrible and all that stuff and then the other group is the vermin it's the it's the rats uh, squirrels foxes are technically vermin as well um, but i think badgers are technically vermin as well aren't they um, and it's an interesting cross-section for me because I find the vermin animals often provide a pathway into veganism for a lot of people because a lot of people will say well why is the badger or the fox any different from fo foxes especially they are basically ginger cat dogs they are fusions of the two um, so a lot of people look at fox and say, I'm against fox hunting because they're so similar to my cat or my dog but as soon as you break through one category it's it's kind of a through road a lot of people will then start questioning well I saw this video of a fox and it was playing with a ball the same way my dog plays with a ball.
but now I'm seeing a cow play with a giant inflatable ball and that line becomes blurred. So it's a very interesting position for me because it kind of occupies a moral space between the two, but the UK public doesn't really get any uh, consumative benefit from fox hunting uh, or the badger cull um, or even just the extermination of rats. People don't like seeing rats around the place, but your average UK person doesn't get something out of there being no rats necessarily. So um, it's, it's a really interesting one, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Well, I a question, but okay. they've got all the money, but we've got the truth. Well, that's exactly it. We have, I think over the past 10 years, and I've, I really feel for anyone who has been vegan for, I mean, I've we've been in this position for what, three years. Anyone who's been vegan for longer than that, five, 10, 20 years, my absolute respect, because the weight of everything against them without the, the current social surgence of veganism to make it popular and make it at least a talking point people can handle discussing, my utmost respect. Um, but we do have the truth. And for a long time, the message has been controlled through traditional media, print media, newspapers, magazines, the television, the radio. The internet has screwed all of that up. We've seen it's got dark sides, the, the fascist movement that's rising in the US and certain problems we have here in the UK I won't get into. Um, but it has good sides as well. The truth cannot be ignored. The truth cannot be taken away. The more people say, well, that's not real. That doesn't apply to the food aid. People see slaughterhouse footage and go, well, that's... Nah, I'm not seeing it because it's this grainy high eight tape footage from the 70s. It doesn't really fit. But now technology's gotten to the point where we can show them a video filmed on an iPhone. We can have someone walking through a slaughterhouse just pop their iPhone in their pocket. Full HD video. It's becoming harder and harder to deny the truth. And because it is just the truth, there's no getting away from it. It's going to be, it's going to get a, a very unpleasant the closer and closer those, the, the end gets. But you're absolutely right. They have the money, but we have the truth. And what we're seeing is people like Tyson, one of the biggest beef producers in the world, selling off their food lots. They don't want part of this, this anymore because there's no money in it. The big companies, the biggest companies are identifying where the problems are. You've got companies that are trying to take down, like Unilever, trying to take down the vegan companies, but also moving into the vegan space themselves. They're not doing it on a moral grounds. They're not doing it because they believe milk should be called milk and it comes from a cow. They're doing it because they're worried about their profit margins. The saddest thing for me about this is a lot of the people who I think should be punished for this whole system, the people who complicitly set up these mechanisms and reinforce it consciously, they won't be punished. They won't, they won't get any justice. Um, the animals won't get justice for that. Our focus can't be the spite and punishing those people. It has to be for the animals. If those people go on to make more money selling other things, that sucks. But so long as the animals come out of it okay and the public is aware of the health costs that meat, dairy and eggs are doing to them, that's the victory we have to take. And I think it's a pretty good victory. Any other questions? Yep. Yep. So I can't quite hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I am. Um, not proud to admit this, but before I was vegan, um, if there was a spot, because I'm terrified of spiders, if there's a spider in the house, oftentimes I would kill it. If it was big, if it was a small one, I'd get him out. If it's a big one, I would, I, I'm not even kidding. The justification I had was, well, this is my territory. So, no, I'm sorry, mate, you lost. Um, the, we were in Poland last year while I was vegan. I got bit by a mosquito and I was walking around with a mosquito on going, come on, out, out, out. I didn't want to hurt him. Because the truth is, once you realize, you can't ignore it anymore. Um, in the past year or so, we've rescued a bumblebee and a pigeon. The bee was fine, the pigeon unfortunately didn't make it, but as soon as you start to connect the dots and realize that all animals have that right, or even f the things that we would traditionally find disgusting, signs of decay that our own biology says we have to avoid, things like maggots and flies, they're doing their thing. And we Ultimately, we have to accept it. Everyone has their place and we have to respect that. The thing with the, I didn't see the program in question, but the thing with silkworms, yeah. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. I mean, it's, the thing with silkworms is 
it's a lot of people think, well, silkworms, they just make silk, like spiders make web. They don't think, how are you going to harvest web from a spider to make a t-shirt? It's nonsense. But they, they just imagine silkworms, they make silk, we use the silk. Bees, they make honey, so we use the honey. There's no thought to, well, why would any animal make something that it doesn't need? Chickens will consume the eggs they've laid because it costs so much biologically for them, so much energy for them to make an egg and lay it. They're not going to go, I'm pretty hungry, but I think I've got about 40% of my daily allotment of energy just to waste and poop it out onto the floor. They need that. Every animal is designed to survive based on its own life cycle or in cooperation with others. Humans, we have our, it's just taken. And silk is a perfect example. A lot of people don't understand how silk is, is harvested. It is brutal. It's horrible. People don't necessarily care because it's, it's worms, it's insects, but at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. It's, whether it's down to in education or ignorance, the message has to be that everything has their place. Exactly. There's another one. Yeah, new vegan documentaries going out each year. Which one? There's so many. <laughs> yeah. We've got, um, it's Dominion's out, isn't it? I know, um, the game changer. Yeah, that's the Jim Cameron, isn't it? I'm excited, I'm a, I'm a proper James Cameron fanboy, so I'm looking forward to that one. Um, yeah, that's gonna be a very interesting one, because again, one of the big holdouts for, against veganism is the Jim Bros. I used to work with a bunch of them. Um, as soon as Arnie went vegan, I stopped that conversation. So, yeah, no, it's exciting. So in terms of handling backlash, I think there's, it depends person to person. Um, with a lot of the guys like um, I used to work with previously, they were very much into their bodies and working out in gyms. They're all manliness, it's all meat and steak and they eat 800 chickens every day. Um, talking about them about an ethical stance didn't work. I would regularly get the whole, yeah, but I'd eat a dog, innit? That's not gonna work. Um, so when it came to those, the case was, well, what do they care about? Well, they care about their bodies and their health. Okay, you know, the world's strongest man is vegan, right? And that is a tank. Um, an increasing number of sports personalities are going vegan. So if that's where their inspiration comes from or what they're interested in, show them that. Um, office spaces can be difficult because no one really chooses to be at work. Um, and you're lumped in with these people that you don't really choose to spend your time with. And if you end up getting involved in uh, vegan arguments, um, it can get a bit tetchy. Um, I've experienced that one myself. So in terms of handling backlash, case by case, but I think the important thing is you don't, um, when you're working, you don't actively make your work life a misery because it's bad enough as it is. It's important to get the truth out there, but, th but there's always a balance. Um, one of the guys that used to give me the most grief back in the day uh, messaged me two months ago he's given veganism a go for 60 days. So they will turn around in the end. At the end of the day, especially guys, I don't want to necessarily generalize, but guys are very much pent up on their, uh, their face saving. If you tell them you're wrong, they won't like that. But they'll go away and have a sneaky Google, and then after a while they might come around to your way of thinking. So it's, yeah. Go. Uh, what time are we at? Quarter two. Uh, I'll stop, any other questions? I'll stop it soon, because I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to set up next. No? Okay, perfect, well. Thanks for listening. Very much. Um, and yeah, if you do have any other questions or anything, then in the hoodie, be wandering around for the rest of the day. So uh, come give me a shout. All right. Thank you.